Ryan Stanton here with ASAP Frontline recording at the Tennessee American College of Emergency Physicians meeting um, in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And um, somebody that I have um, had not direct interactions with, but uh, kind of flybys over the last several years between podcasting and his work that we'll talk about here momentarily. And then come to find out in his talk that he gave here in, uh, in Chattanooga that um, he knows a little bit about my neck of the woods now in Lexington, well outside of Lexington, um, a little small ER where he, where he has worked in the past. So I have Dr. Edwin Leet, um, I think more emergency physician of course, uh, lives in South Carolina, kind of seems like he works a little bit of everywhere, um, mostly east of the Mississippi it sounds like, and um, for now. And But I, what I want to bring him here is because of what you don't realize when you learn your countries, when you learn, when you get your globe and you spin it and you point at it and you get your countries, there's one that's missing on there. And um, this man is the self-appointed uh, prime minister, uh, dictator, uh, tyrannical leader of Emergistan. And uh, so we want to talk about Emergistan, life in Emergistan. And little do you know, as an emergency physician, you are a citizen of this country. So Dr. Leap, first, thanks for joining us. And second, tell us about Emergistan. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be here and to talk to you about Emergistan, my favorite country in the whole world. So a few years ago, I was writing the column for EM News, and I, and I really wanted to highlight the fact that we are a unique group of people with a unique workplace and environment. And I thought, let's call it a country. Let's come up with a name for a country. And I just struggle with this because if you're not careful nowadays, you can make people mad uh, coming up with names or word plays. And I'm from West Virginia. I thought, uh, West Emergenia. Uh, um, nah. And then it, come to, it came to me that Emergistan just seemed like the right exotic sound for all the exotic and strange things that we see. And so that was what I called it. I called uh, the column something like Emergistan, the first column. And it morphed into many other uh, plays on that and, a, and a, a book that Lippincott did for me called Life in Emergistan. And so Emergistan is our place. We are Emergistanis. Uh, our our, our uh, job is unique. Our culture is unique. Our character is unique. The patients we see are very unique. It's its own place, and it's, a, it's not a place of physicality. It's as much a mindset as anything else. But we do have, you know, we, we Emergistanis live in, in all over the country, all over the world, in big hospitals and small. In your talk, I, mean, I think where I, what I got from your your talk was that you say a lot of what we think. I mean, it's actually just a, a audible characterization of our life in emergency medicine, the challenges we face, the things we see, and uh, it, it's real. I mean, it's a, it is incredibly a, a unique environment in emergency medicine. It's evolved significantly over the last two to three decades from the room where the primary care physician and the surgeons just put their patients that were coming in to come down and check them out to now um, really honestly probably the most active aspect of, of medicine in terms of what I like to call it now the air traffic control of the of the healthcare system where you come in there and we direct you and the direct get you where you need to be so give us some of these insights that you have from Emergistan um, and the Emergistanis on how um, our life what it's like um, and just some of those observations you've made about our unique world. You know, I, I think that um, there's so many things I could go into here, but but one of the things that I, I think I should highlight is that uh, in, in Emergistan, we really um, are a tough bunch of people. And and in that, that endurance, in that persistence, we, we carry the weight of a lot of dysfunction in medicine and in society. So when things go bad in life for anyone, Nowadays, the first place to go seems to be the emergency department, and 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 so our world is not only to um, take care of people who don't have access to health care, but to take care of people who don't have access to any sort of functional worldview or know how to, people who don't know how to, how to run their own lives. They can't cope with anything, and and uh, and that's part of it. And then of course there's those who struggle with the healthcare system, uh, who can't get access to health care, and they don't have doctors because they have insurance, or their insurance doesn't take anyone. So we take care of them. And, and in, our, in our ability to just press through, we, we take care of enormous numbers of people at all hours of the day and night in a fog of, of, of mystery. I mean, we take care of people who have complaints we can barely sort through, some of whom have really bad illnesses that we have to tease out. We do that when we're tired. We do that when we're hungry. We do that when we're often all alone. 
We do that to the um, dismay of the rest of the medicine who doesn't understand why we're not doing things faster or better for them. Uh, we do it with a sense of humor. We do it with a sense of camaraderie. Uh, I'm amazed at how well we all work together, no matter how different we are. We can all pull it together. We can do the right thing for the patient. We can do the right thing for the hospital. We can make it work. We're experts at at sorting through complex problems. We're experts at disposition. We're experts at cajoling and controlling people who are having bad attitudes or are dangerous. We're fearless. I've never seen a bunch of people who would walk into a room where there's a dangerous infection or a dangerous person and act like it's nothing. We walk into rooms with psychotic, violent people and say, hey, can I get you some dinner? And they respond to that. It's incredible what we can do. I think we bring a sense of calm and part of it's our training and part of it's our experience. But what I'm most impressed with is just uh, the willingness of the people of Murdistan to do the right thing in all the wrong circumstances. Give us some of the challenges, some of the biggest threats. So the United States, we may have you know issues with China and Russia and uh, ISIS and all of those things, but what are some of the threats to Emergistan? What are the things that we are fighting uh, when it comes to sovereignty? I believe that we're fighting against an overwhelming administrative state um, that, that seeks to determine everything we do by algorithm and rule. Uh, I just was uh, received a bunch of emails from a small hospital I work at the other day, and they're owned by a larger system. And I think I had six or seven administrative change emails in one day. I, I think the burden of regulation uh, is great and threatens Emergistan. And if you look at uh, the increase in numbers of physicians or cost, I should say, of health care, administrative costs far outstrip physician costs. And the same thing is true in universities where numbers of professors have stayed stable for decades, but administrators far outnumber professors now. I think that's a big threat. Uh, and, and a part of that is, uh, or associated with that, is we have this struggle with things like EMR, where we all know we need it. There are things it does very well. But when we say this system doesn't work for me, our administrators say, well, you'll get used to it. Everybody else is using it. So I think there's this disconnect between what we do on the ground, because we're the ones who see the patients, we're the ones who make the money for the system, and then we have layers and layers and layers of people over top of us. I think that's an insidious invasion of Emergistan, um, where we have been sort of betrayed from the inside by people we thought would help us. Uh, as a friend of mine says, um, so we are the customers of the, of the um, administrators, whereas uh, the patients are our customers. And I think there's some truth to that. So I, so I believe administrative creep, I believe EMR, um, I believe customer service model is a problem to the extent that it causes problems like the narcotic addiction epidemic. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been told for so long, oh, you guys are so heartless, you should get more pain medicine. And then we started doing that because we didn't believe it, but we were, we were told to get good customer satisfaction scores because it's what hospitals wanted. And now they're, they're saying, how dare you do that? Well, we, we told you all along it was a bad idea. So, so I think the customer service model, administrative state, EMR, those are, those are the, some of the biggest threats right now. Uh, I, I think you know, insurance issues, the Affordable Care Act changes, that's a, that's a problem we can deal with because we're de dedicated to doing the right thing. But we're, we're overwhelmed by, by rules and algorithms that don't work with our lives, don't work with the, the reality of patients on the ground. You know, when, when we're told that the multiple visit Dilaudid seeking patient we know well is a customer that we should treat nicely, I think there's a disconnect between reality and, uh, and what people believe or want to believe. As T.S. Uh, T.S. Eliot said, between the idea and the reality falls the shadow. In one point in time, the Emergistanis, the Pedistanis, the Metastanis, the Sergistanis, we all, as physician leaders in, in, our own, in our countries, our particular countries, we kind of drove this ship, and over the last couple of decades, our role as particular um, countries, um, our own little countries, has dwindled. And it's you mentioned the administrative oversight, you know, the other larger behemoth uh, countries, the C-suites and things like that, um, putting pressure on the hospital. How do how do we as emerges Stanies establish a role and and take back because I feel like now and so often and it's why I love the job I have now because it's it's a democratic group we still have voice we still have a place a seat at the table with the other um, physicians of the hospital but that seems to be something that's been lost in the emergency room the physician as as much the leader and 
you know, at any point a physician can be dropped, like just in a snap, they say, we want you off the schedule, and you are, just because of a contract or whatever. How do we, as physicians, put our foot down and, and stand up and, and say, you know, this is our department, we need, to, we need to help direct this thing, and we need to do it in order to protect and help our patients and, and make sure we provide the best care possible? That's a hard question, uh, and I, uh, I don't know that I have an exact answer, but I would say that one of the most important things is for us to allow, truth, allow people to speak the truth. I mean, I, there are many groups and, and centers where physicians who complain about a problem are considered anathema. They're, not a, they're heretics and often shown the door. And I think as groups, we need to allow people to speak the truth. We need to, we need to write about this. We need to talk to our congressman about this. We need to push back. Um, you know, it's hard because our specialty is so important. Our job is so important. There are fields where people do work stoppages when things go wrong. Nobody in emergency medicine wants to do a work stoppage. We, we don't want to hurt people. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, I think, and, and I'm not a huge fan of the idea, there may be a time as administrative state grows, as large multi-group uh, facil- organizations grow, that maybe unionization will happen. I don't know that that'll happen. But more important than that, I think we have to speak, speak honestly, push back, encourage, encourage democratic groups. And honestly, there are a lot of hospitals in America that struggle to find emergency physicians. I think if we're unhappy in the centers where we're being pushed around, we should all go to these small hospitals, these rural centers, these suburban centers, and start groups here where they're happy to have physicians, where they can't find doctors. Maybe a migration from the big centers is the way to go. I don't know the answer to this, but I think honesty and pushing back, as every time we can, we should push back. We should write about it, blog about it, podcast about it, talk about it, and we should talk to our politicians, representatives about it. We should be candid with our administrators. We can't just coddle them with what they want to hear, and that's not always going to work. Sometimes they're not going to like it. I would love to see personally, a rating system for administrative uh, systems in hospitals. So we have, we're, we're all um, rated online. We get satisfaction scores. What if we had administrative satisfaction scores that were published online? What if there were a website that, that you could go to and, and read what other physicians had written anonymously about working in a particular hospital uh, and, and that were available to the public? I think that could, that could change things because it would, it would lift the curtain on what's going on behind. Because personally, I think if you're an administrator and you've pressured someone to give um, narcotics and they were fired because they didn't, you try to practice medicine, you should be sued for that. Mm-hmm. I think that's, that's an abuse of power. So I think those are things we can do, that we can migrate to, to facilities where we can actually start our groups again, make those groups pleasant and wonderful places to work. That's what I'm trying to do where I'm working, I'm trying to get a good EMR, trying to make it a physician-friendly site. Then physicians want to go there. And eventually... Um, somebody's going to learn the lesson that the way to make this work is to make the physicians happy. I gave a talk back in the fall uh, called um, called Physician Satisfaction Scores, and I think we need that. Not just physician, not just patient satisfaction, but physician satisfaction scores. Make the doctors happy. Make the do- happy doctors do a great job. Patients know that. They know when the doctors are, are satisfied, when they know when the doctors are competent. Then I think physicians want to go to those places. And administrators will see a, a loss of people from the places that are unpleasant. That's what I would suggest. And it's going to happen. I mean, I think it almost has to happen. Um, there's such an influx of physicians to these larger, you know, larger city centers. You know, whether it's not giant metropolis, but you, you even mentioned in your talk this morning about a small rural hospital in Kentucky that I know uh, well, mainly from passing, but uh, never worked there, but um, worked in a very similar hospital uh, through residency and right out of residency. And... It is a unique environment because, you know, as the hospital gets smaller or more rural or more remote, the emergency physician takes on a more and more significant role, not just the screening that you may get in academic center or the initiation of evaluation and treatments within consultations to specialists. You know, when you work in that small four-bed ER hospital that may only have 10 or 12 patients admitted at a time, you're the only doctor in-house probably 18 hours of the day on weekends, and so you are everything. You are the rapid response team. You are the code team. You are the, um, in many ways, in some places now, the ER physician and hospitalist. And so the our role is growing, and yet, um, and yet I think I fe- constantly feel like our position is being trivialized as other anything other than. Um, basically a, a factory worker of medicine where we just put out the product and keep your mouth shut and go home at the end of the day. You know, 
a couple of places I've worked, I've, I've seen what we can be capable of and how people can love us. Um, and, and I don't say that because I'm any better than anybody else, but just because of experience. I remember working at a hospital in Colorado that was so far out that we had to send a STEMI by fixed wing to a center, okay? Not by helicopter, but fixed wing. And when we had, this guy went into VFib, we shocked him, he came back, we sent him. And the nurse looked at me and said, I'm so glad you're here because you made a decision. And we did the right thing and got it going. And then when I was working in the hospital, you talked about in Kentucky, I remember one time I intubated a patient and the, uh, the staff actually looked at me and said, so that's how that's supposed to look. Th this is what we see when we take the right training to these places, we become valuable and they love us. And if you think that wouldn't change the face of medicine, it will because they, because I'll tell you the place in Colorado, when I went there, uh, they said to me in the afternoon, they said, by the way, in the drawer is a, is a menu. By four o'clock, tell us which one for dinner and we'll make it and bring it down to you. And if it's not on the menu, just tell us, we'll make it anyway. That was the value of the physician there because you were there 24 hours, winter, spring, summer, fall, snowfall, windstorm, it didn't matter, you were there. When we make ourselves that valuable and the staff and the community know that, that that's power. That's power because no administrator has that power. We have that power to save lives and see and have a staff and community that are comfortable with us. I mean, you have no idea what you can do if you go to these centers and bring your expertise and the calm and the confidence that you have when you walk into a room. I've had nurse practitioners say to me, I like working with you because I know that whatever happens, you could handle it, and I'm not, and I'm not, on, the, I'm not on, uh, on, uh, on guard all the time trying to think what am I going to do. You can handle it, and that makes me comfortable and happy. That's a great thing. That's an honor for us, and we can change medicine that way. I remember the small hospital where I worked, uh, Moonlighting, um, we mentioned it four rooms, probably an old schoolhouse, I think it was. Um, you know, the ER, the physician's room was a broom closet with a computer that if you closed the door, it overheated. And I remember getting a, a patient that was a strep meningitis, and it was the first lumbar puncture in, in central line that the staff had ever seen. Yeah. And it was, it, it was truly amazing, but it was the exact same thing that, you know, it was – they had basically, you know, what we consider as a school in school age, the lunch lady, right. um, or the you know cafeteria staff come down, you know, at, towards the end of lunch. And he's a you know a physician most of the time. You're working through, you don't even think about it, and come down and say, after Doctor Stanton, I'm about to close up. I want to make you something, get you something before I head out. Whatever you want. My wife actually did some work at that same hospital. She's a vegetarian. They brought in uh, vegetarian options for her, made her, made her stuff that she can eat um, while she was there because, of course, it's a smaller town where um, the highest end um, the highest end restaurant is probably a, a KF, KFC with a with a rock facade. And, um, it, you know, it, it's that sort of thing in medicine, you know, is – one, I think we're starting to lose it, but it's still there in those smaller hospitals, and you do have such an opportunity to make an to make an impact. And it is so different; it is so different in terms of the satisfaction of the staff. So, the hospital I work now in the last thirty years has only had, I think, two physicians leave in thirty years because they are so. The hospital respects the physicians and respects their input and helps drive. Um, STEMI care and stroke care and everything else and so you have a seat at the table and there is incredible value with that and something we need to try to get back into medicine especially these larger centers where they still see emergency medicine as the stepchild that or the necessary evil that we have to have an emergency room but eh, let's let's either hit the easy button and get somebody in here and tell them what we want and manage it or um, you know we're just going to have to deal with it when in fact it is continually growing um, honestly, in our in our state, about seven and a half percent per year, seven or eight percent per year in volume, um, more and more becoming the hub of medicine. Sure. But I want to get to some of the things with Emergistan. You have some cool things in Emergistan. Give us some of the breakdown of Emergistan's flag, okay. your logo, and some of those cool things. So everybody out there who's an Emergistani and may not know it yet knows when to uh, when to stand for the pledge and, and to recognize the mottos and such. So uh, our flag uh, is a, a circular shield with a vulture, okay, on three horizontal bars, one that's red, green, and blue. And it's uh, red for blood, green for pus, and blue for hypoxia. The vulture is holding in one talon 
a syringe, and in one town, a stethoscope for intervention and diagnostics. I think we'll have to change the stethoscope to ultrasound probe eventually because that's just the lay of the land. The motto is Semper Adecim, always attend. So if you're wearing the pin, uh, or you decide to put this up, and the administration says, what's that mean? You can say, well, we always seek for, a t we're always looking for a 10 in satisfaction scores. But what it really means is the pain score is always a 10. Always a 10. So Semper Adecum is our motto for, for the Republic of Murdistan. And I'll see if I can remember the motto. <laughs> uh, I, I have a pledge, right? I pledge allegiance to the Republic of Murdistan and to all the men and women working uh, in facilities large and small, uh, doing, what, doing the impossible with limited resources, taking care of everyone day and night, and t saying no to drugs and to narcotics and antibiotics, uh, uh, no matter what. Uh, I'm in. I think it's something like that. I have to look at it. I'm in play ball. Play, I'm in play ball. Yeah, right. So I didn't have it in front of me. I'm sorry. But but a, a few years ago, I actually wrote an ode to a murder stand poem. I'll have to find it somewhere. So that that that's the that's the the lay of the land. We do. Ha I have some people over the years that have come to me and said I want a noble title in the in the in the land of Murdistan. And we have several that people have emailed me over the years. We have a minister of munitions, uh, who's a fellow shooter like me. We have um, uh, we have I think we have minister of modern dance. We have so kind of whatever you want to be. Uh, I, I I can make this happen for you. I can uh, for a small fee. I can make you a, a lord or lady of Murdistan. Uh, in fact, if you just send me what you want to be, I'll just appoint you. Uh, send me a send me an email, we'll appoint you uh, whatever you want to be in the Murdistan. Because we've got to have nobles, we've got to have a government. I need to have you loyal to me so that there's no coup in the future. Because I am in charge. That's it. Well, and as you know, with any good dictatorial um, community, uh, there has to be money and bribes involved in order to get those positions. Uh, I think that's true pretty much of every government in the world, in world history. So I'm, I'm okay with bribes. I don't think, I don't have a personal problem with that as long as uh, we're all upfront about it. That's the great thing about Emergistan. We can be upfront about this. We love each other. I'm not going to judge you. You don't judge me. Send me the money. <laughs> <laughs> so tell everybody, um, one, about the, where we can get the book. Uh, two is uh, um, how folks can contact you if they have any uh, questions or if they want to go ahead and send you an envelope full of unmarked bills. Um, or uh, uh, where else we may, we can find you? So you can find me on the web at www.edwinleap.com. That's my blog. You can uh, find the book online at nursingcenter.com. Uh, Lippincott parked it at the nursingcenter.com. It's Life in Emergistan. Probably if you looked at Amazon, you might find a link to it or if you Google search it. If you want a print copy, you have to contact the editor of, the, of EM News. If you want to drop me an email, uh, edwinleap at gmail.com. I can tell you how to do that, how to get print copies of the book. There aren't that many, but they exist. Uh, Lippincott wanted to do mostly e-books. Uh, so that's how, you get, that's how you get the book. Uh, that's on my website. You can email me, as I said, edwinleap at gmail.com. Happy to communicate with you. You can follow me on Facebook. You can follow me on Twitter. Um, I have um, uh, a couple other venues. You'll sometimes see my columns at Kevin MD, Kevin Foe's site online. Uh, there I have an archive there. And uh, I write for a couple of the publications for the Greenville News in Greenville, South Carolina. I write a health column for the South Carolina Baptist Courier. And I just started writing for what's called the Daily Yonder. The Daily Yonder is a national magazine of rural life. And so I'll be writing about rural health care and rural communities and, uh, and, and the, the sort of the world through that. My column is called Life and Limb. So you can go to the Daily Yonder and find me there. And, we can, and I'm going to talk more about rural life and rural hospitals and how we could maybe make that migration of some good quality people into the rural community where hospitals are struggling. That's incredible. So I've got the podcasting TV. You've got the print. Thank God for that. Um, <laughs> my, my wife and uh, mother still correct my print. So um, I try to keep things either verbal um, or on the uh, TV side just so I can't have it uh, pointed out and corrected. And but gosh, my mom, my mom corrects my Facebook posts. She, oh, she, she contacts me and says, hey, you got to you misplaced something there. I'm like, wow. What, I mean, she's a teacher. She's you know, she was a teacher. So fantastic woman. But uh, um, thank you for what you do. You're doing incredible work. And um, one thing and, and I assume it will still be there um, at the EM News booth. They often will have your books there at um, at the ASEP conference, 
and I, th- I think the last number of years I've gone by there, there's been been some. If not, uh, we'll reach out and tell them to print some for next time because we're going to go ahead and start the charge that they need to go ahead and have those because we're going to send some people there. Well, thank you very much. And I'm, I'll talk to them about that uh, to try to get that done. And I'll see if we can get some emergency stamp pins there again this year that have the flag on it because we had those in years past. Uh, and by the way, I, 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 I dub you Minister of Media and Communications. Fantastic. So the new, the the uh, prime minister and uh, the tyrant of uh, Emergistan has now dubbed me the minister of media and communication. That is good. It's, uh, it seems to be a natural thing that I love to do. So I take on that role wonderfully and uh, I will fly the, fly the flag proudly for the uh, upcoming future. As for me, you can follow us online at the Facebook page. That's the ASAP Frontline uh, Facebook page. Also on uh, the Twitter at, uh, at Everyday Med. And uh, feel free to contact me as well, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com. That's youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com. Fantastic. I appreciate you coming down. Great finally getting to sit down and talk with you. Usually it's just me um, walking by while you're with a large group of uh, people talking to Merge's stand at these conferences. So it's good to sit down one-on-one and uh, chit-chat about medicine. It's a great pleasure to be here, man. Thank you so much. And until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline. Frontline.